the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. This is the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it's also our resurrection. In which way? Last night, Father Summers was telling us and insisting with us over and over again, we've left the tomb. Our Lord has left the tomb behind. Don't go back to it. What this means is, our Lord could have made some spectacle already on the day of Good Friday and come down from the cross. Just to repeat those words, sounds like a blasphemy because they were used by our Lord's enemies, but that was not our Lord's purpose. Our Lord's purpose was not to put on a good show and impress everybody who hadn't been impressed already by the rising, raising of Lazarus and raising of other people and all kinds of miracles. If they weren't impressed already with the fact that he was God, they were not going to be impressed either if he'd done some miracle to come down from the cross. It's kind of vain to, um, you know, hypothesize about these things because it's all a bunch of what if, when in fact we have the fact that our Lord rose from the grave, which is much more important than any coming down from the cross to prove to a few people that just would not believe in him anyway that he was God. And you see, our Lord did a far greater miracle than coming down from the cross. He died, he let himself be completely subject to death in order to beat death. He let himself apparently be completely subject to sin in order to beat sin. I think Mel Gibson has a very good interpretation of the whole story in his film when uh, it wasn't two seconds after the crucifixion of our Lord when the devil just went bananas because he knew exactly what just happened. He, the devil, had been tricked. He was so into getting his revenge on this man who had never sinned and getting revenge on this man who claimed to be God and getting revenge on the people of God to make them turn against him that finally the devil went right down a trap, his own pride, and he saw that, uh-oh, I just crucified the man that's going to be the, my, my undoing, the undoing of my kingdom, the devil's kingdom. Because in our Lord's crucifixion, the war, and the war is already won. The divinity of Christ has already crushed the devil's kingdom. And now all that remains is for we, the baptized souls, who are members of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live it out. Live out our Lord's life and live out our Lord's crucifixion in ourselves and continue to beat the devil. And how do we beat the devil? We beat the devil the same way that our blessed Lord did. The world comes at us with all kinds of persecution. Our friends, maybe, social contacts, and our family come at us with their persecution in different ways. I don't know, just sort of kind of doubting the faith compared to us who want to take the faith seriously. Or we try to follow the Ten Commandments and we get pressure against us because we're being too rigid. Or we're trying to offer up a few sacrifices and we come up kind of against the demon of ourselves, so to speak, which is saying, come on, you don't need to do all that sacrifice. You don't need to obey all those commandments. You don't need to practice all that patience and charity and, and just long suffering of life. You don't have to suffer, go through those things. And uh, if we listen to that voice, which might even come from ourselves, um, then we're letting the devil win. It's as if we are our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and the devil is throwing all kinds of suffering at us. And what does our blessed Lord do? He just says, Give me more. Give me more. Whatever it takes to pay the price for the sin of men. And even these people that are persecuting me, my first word, as Father Gomez told us on Monday night, is have mercy on them. Forgive them. I really want what I'm doing right here on the cross to convert those people. I don't want heaven to be empty. I want those souls to be there. And if I have some way of changing them around, I'm going to do it. And so... Even though our Lord went to his death on the cross, uh, it was the greatest strategy possible because then you had the far greater miracle of this resurrection, this rising from the grave. You and I have heard about it ever since our youth, you know, re reading the book of Acts or reading the Gospels. 
and we've taken that in with our mother's milk, and it's a beautiful thing. A child has, it's sort of like easy for a child to understand that. A child lives in wonder, so this all fits into the program. And, you know, just like the God becomes a man, and he looks like a little baby, helpless baby, in a manger, in, in, in a stable, and the children capture that. But he's God. And now we're on the other side of our Lord's life, where he has been put to death, he's been in the grave for three days, and he rises. A child sees that, hears that, understands that, and that's just the way it is. And we grew up with that. Uh, but you know, when that was new, uh, it was not so easy to accept. Because it wasn't coming to children in their uh, what do they call it, lisping voices in the catechism class that Christ rose from the dead. Have a look at... Um, St. Paul's encounter with the Greeks in the book of Acts. Uh, he says, I've come here to tell you about the unknown God whom all of you worship, but you don't know his name. He says, I, I know, he says, I know him. It's the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, but he has sent his son. And that son was put to death and he rose from the grave. The Greeks simply say, come back to us another day. We'll hear you another time. Some interpret that as saying they, they laughed him to scorn, St. Paul. And these were grown men, Greeks, great philosophers. They've always had, have had the gift of philosophy, the Greeks. They laughed St. Paul to scorn. The first time he mentioned to them, this son of God rose from the grave. They said, that's ridiculous. Who can believe such a thing? You see? That's how it affects a person who's never had catechism and has not kind of drunk this in uh, ever since their youth that our Lord rose from the grave. It's a big deal. And you and I, we receive that in our, our catechism. It's a beautiful thing. That's the best way to receive it. But we have to appreciate it more and more. And again, going back to the sermon of Father Summers last night, I guess that was actually this morning, but it was still dark out. Uh, uh, we show that we believe in the resurrection by the way we believe, by the way we behave in our own lives. And so Father was saying, not exactly these words, but this is the point. If you really believed in the resurrection, you would do like our Lord did and leave those, that death behind. Our Lord rose from the grave. The, uh, well, he passed through the, um, the stone uh, without moving it away. That was moved away later. But our Lord rose from the grave, passed out of the tomb, and left all that death behind. The death of the cross and the death of sin. And then, as he said, I go on to Galilee. My disciples will find me, find me in Galilee. Not here in Jerusalem, because I'm leaving this life where sin is associated with it. They, come and, they can come and find me somewhere else now. I'm living the supernatural life now. The life of grace. Our Lord was always living the life of grace, but his movements were significant. Leave death behind. Leave sin behind. Every time that we say, I'm not going to be that much against the world. I'm not going to be that much against my own passions. I'm not going to practice that much sacrifice. We're making an agreement to kind of live with sin again and live with death again. We're not supposed to do that. And if we really believed in our Lord's resurrection, we would avoid those things. So I'm not saying that it's a bad thing that we received all this um, catechism as children and understood the resurrection of it as if it was the most normal thing. That's a very good thing. I'm just saying we've come along a few years now, whatever it is, 20, 30, 50, 60 years, and it's part of our faith, and it's, it's, the, it's the foundation of our faith. If our Lord had not risen from the grave, he would not be God. And if he's not God, his death on the cross does not pay for my sins. And if my sins haven't been paid for yet, I have no hope of salvation. Those are St. Paul's words, and they're very, very logical. And they're huge, and it's such a, it, it's such a um, you know, substantial fact, unavoidable fact, without it, there is no God, there is no religion, and everything else that John Lennon sang about. <laughs> uh, the um, the uh, important thing, if that resurrection is true, and we absolutely know it's true, we have to live it out in ourselves. 
we have to live it out in ourselves. And that's a glorious calling. I just think of that, you know. It's the greatest moment that has ever happened in this world is God becoming man, God taking on flesh. In a certain way, it's the greatest thing that's ever happened in heaven also for God to glorify his son like that. Uh, and then that all came to a climax with the death on the cross, which is the redemption, and then the resurrection three days later to show us what was this death on the cross. That was the conquering of the devil. That was the final battle against the devil. It's as if the last battle has already been won, but now in time, time is different than eternity. Time continues for thousands of years after the crucifixion, but there are other battles now that sort of lead to that giant battle that our Lord has already won. Uh, it's as if uh, uh, the war has already been won, but our Lord is saying, now you soldiers all around me, you got to kind of go back in time and uh, go through all the battles that are going to help me make that war victorious against Satan. Something like that. It's, maybe it's a bad comparison, but you know, now that Christ has won the battle, the war against Satan, he tells all of us, now it's your turn to be part of that war and do your part in winning the war against Satan. That's our invitation. The resurrection is not just a historical fact. It certainly is that, by the way. You know, a modernist would like to get away with saying, yes, the uh, faith of Jesus certainly rose from the grave. The historical Jesus, well, that's another question. <laughs> These guys are schizophrenic or something. I don't know how you can separate the historical Jesus from the Jesus of faith, but somehow they got complicated minds that are able to uh, square the circle. Uh, the important thing is, no, our Lord Jesus Christ has risen from the grave. It's the greatest historical fact there ever was. Uh, but don't just leave it there. All of us have a part in that. Our Lord rose from the grave, is victorious over Satan, and now it's our turn to be part of his victory over Satan. That's the invitation that all of us re receive today. We've got to answer it. And uh, you've all done a lot of hard work. It's been 40 days of loving our blessed Lord. You know, you're coming out here for Friday evening um, mass and stations and oh, way of the cross and conference and confessions and everything. Really large, um, edifying crowds. I, I don't... I, I haven't been in a lot of places, but I haven't seen that anywhere else, the proportion of people that come to church here during the week. And that's a sign of what you're doing in your homes, out of love for our blessed Lord. So, you know, you've invested a lot of time in this already. You've invested a lot of sacrifice and love in this already. Let's just go the next step. Our Lord has left the death of the tomb behind him. And all of us are going to leave the death of sin behind us now. That's the way we believe in the resurrection. That's the way we live the resurrection. Our Blessed Mother, you might have noticed, she was absent from the story we just had in the Gospel. We just had three Marys going to the tomb of our Lord to anoint Him. Mary Magdalene, Mary <coughs> Salome, and Mary, the wife of Zebedee. Um, what good women, you know? Uh, so dedicated to our Lord, they want to make sure that his body is well taken care of. And of all the Marys, the Mary of all Marys, the mother of God, didn't go. And there's absolutely no selfishness in that. What there is in that is that she, the mother of God, knew that he wasn't there. And so she stayed in her room praying. That is why Saturdays are dedicated to the mother of God, because she was the only one of the millions of people on the earth that said, no, my son's going to rise from the grave. He always told us so. And then this morning, Sunday, first day of the week, uh, she stayed in her room praying as well because he's gone. He's not in the tomb. Bless these women who are so devoted to him, but they will find a surprise. And uh, for that reason, Our Lady merited to receive the first visit from the Son of God. And uh, I bring that up because... You know, if we have a hard time living in a faithful way to what I just said about live the resurrection, 
leave sin behind. Just join up with the mother of God. She'll make sure that you have the strength to leave sin behind and always be that person waiting for this visit from our Lord in one way or another. May God bless you on this holy feast of Easter. It's the greatest day of we, the Christians, of our Lord Jesus Christ's church. In the name of the Father and the Son, Holy Ghost. Amen.